Hello, in this video we're going to talk about a well-known and popular oscillator, the Weinbridge oscillator. And the Weinbridge oscillator consists of a circuit with the following configuration. Um, an amplifier, which I have labeled plus A, just to indicate it's a non-inverting amplifier with a gain of A. Uh, and then if you take it from the output, you can see a, a feedback network uh, comprising a, uh, a series configuration of a resistor and a capacitor, which I've labeled R R2 and C2, and a parallel configuration of a resistor and a capacitor, which I've labeled R1 and C1. Uh, typically, in a Weinbridge oscillator, um, R1 and R2 will be equal to each other, and C1 and C2 will be equal to each other, and therefore those might just be labeled simply R A, and C. But notice that uh, what we have there consists of a, uh, a high-pass filter followed by a low-pass filter. Uh, so it's a, a frequency-selective type of feedback network. It makes it so by the addition of capacitors. Uh, what do I say the series combination is a high-pass filter? Notice that for very low frequencies, uh, the, capacitance, the capacitor is going to act as an open circuit, and therefore um, the series combination Will be, will be acting as a high pass filter, meaning it will cut or be open to low frequencies and the capacitor will act as a short for high frequencies. Whereas in the parallel combination, the opposite thing is true. Uh, the capacitor will be an open for, uh, low, uh, for low frequencies and therefore the signal will go through R1, but for very high frequencies, C1 will act as a short and it will, um, a short connected in parallel with R1 will basically swamp R1. So we have a high pass filter in series with a low pass filter and uh, the combination of the two in the one bridge oscillator becomes, uh, the overall effect becomes that of a band pass filter. And uh, what ends up happening is that we will have a circuit for which the amplitude will vary. Uh, the magnitude of the circuit essentially uh, will start at zero for very low frequencies and then it will increase just like that of a band pass filter and then it will decrease again, and so it will reach a maximum value at the circuit's resonant frequency. That will be the magnitude of beta, which is the feedback uh, factor of the gain or the gain of the feedback network. Uh, and then the phase shift um, is uh, for the first half of the circuit is going to be dominated by uh, the the lead portion of the network, and uh, for the uh, after the resonant frequency is going to be dominated by the lag, po lag portion of the network, because essentially what we have uh, with that high pass low pass combination is what we will refer to as a lead lag network, meaning the phase angle will uh, be leading or positive all the way to plus 90 degrees for part uh, or a range of frequencies, and then it will decrease, it will be it will go all the way to negative 90 degrees. Um, and it will be exactly zero at the resonant frequency. And so we want to be able to calculate what is the resonant frequency of the circuit because, again, when we are designing an oscillator, we typically want to know what values of capacitors and resistors we need to use in order to achieve the resonant frequency of our choice. Um, so now that we have looked a little bit qualitatively at how the circuit operates, uh, we're going to go ahead and derive some expressions so that we can apply the Backhausen criterion. And the Backhausen criterion tells us that in order to sustain uh, an oscillation, the loop gain, which is A times beta, must be equal to 1. And the phase shift around the loop must be equal to 0 degrees or an integer multiple of 360 degrees. And so in order to uh, start applying the Backhausen criterion, we need to come up with an expression for the loop gain, so that then we can equate it to 1. The loop gain, GL, is going to be equal to A times beta. They're both functions uh, of frequency, typically. Um, and notice that my beta is going to be uh, basically the ratio of my uh, input voltage, if you will, to my output voltage. is going to be the gain of that uh, feedback network that I have there, the combination of uh, what I will call impedance number two, formed by the, the series combination of R2 and C2. So this will be my overall impedance C2. It's basically R2 plus 1 over J omega C2. 
and uh, my impedance Z1, which is basically R1 in parallel with 1 over J omega Z1. And so my uh, beta is going to be the result of dividing V1 divided by V out, meaning I know that my V in, which is the input to my circuit, is going to be equal to beta times V out. And just by looking at the circuit, I can see that there is uh, a voltage division going on there. Um, and so this is going to be equal to Z1 divided by Z1 plus C2 times V out, where beta is going to be equal to Z1 divided by Z1 plus C2. So my GL, which is A times beta, is going to be equal to A times Z1 divided by Z1 plus C2, where Z1 and C2 would be those series and parallel combinations. Now, I'm not going to go through the overall derivation. Uh, you can look that up in a reference book or in your textbook. But if you go through the derivation of, of replacing Z1 by its value and Z2 by its value, um, and assuming that um, R and C, uh, that R1 is equal to R2 and equal to R, and C1 is equal to C2 and equal to C, uh, we will arrive at the following expression, where A times beta will be equal to J omega A times RC divided by 1 minus omega squared R squared C squared plus J, 3 omega RC. Uh, so this will be my transfer function for, um, for the loop gain. Now, applying the Barkhausen criterion, I need for the following, I need for the magnitude of this to be equal to 1, which uh, in order for this to be equal to 1, essentially what needs to happen is that my numerator is equal to my denominator, so I can rewrite this as J omega ARC being equal to oops, 1 minus omega squared R squared C squared plus J3 omega RC. Now notice that I have a complex expression on both sides of the equation, and as we have mentioned, in order for uh, the magnitude to be equal to 1 and the phase shift to be equal to 0, we need for the real part uh, to be equal to, um, uh, to 1 and the imaginary part to be equal to 0. But in this case, uh, since I have an equation, I can equate the real parts from both sides of the equation. The real part on the left-hand side of the equation is 0. Uh, the so zero. The real part on the right hand side of the equation is one minus omega squared r squared c squared, and my imaginary parts must be equal to each other as well. And so that means that omega a r c must be equal to three omega r c. Um. Again, from, uh, by solving this equation, I can come up with the expression for omega, which tells me omega is equal to 1 over rc. Or, if I wanted it in terms of f, it will be equal to 1 over 2 pi rc. And from the uh, imaginary part equation, or portion of the equation, I conclude that they must be equal to 3. And so this basically consists of the, um, the constraints that will make my circuit behave as an oscillator. I need for the gain of my non-inverting amplifier to be equal to 3, positive 3, and uh, my frequency of oscillation is basically going to be determined by the values of R and C, those capacitors and resistors. And it's going to be equal to 1 over 2 pi RC. That's um, the resonant frequency for that circuit, so I'm going to write it here as well. Uh, equal to 1 over 2 pi rc and yeah, resonant frequency 1 over 2 pi rc and basically we have that uh, the bar and criterion is met when the imaginary part um, when the gain is equal to 3 the gain of the non-inverting amplifier and since that is the condition that makes the overall loop gain equal to 1 uh, we must conclude that the 
the gain of beta at the resonant frequency is equal to one third. And so we can complete also this picture by writing one third there. And so basically what I will have if I design the circuit uh, using a non-inverting amplifier configuration with a gain of three, I should have a sustained oscillation at the resonant frequency. And again, the resonant frequency is going to be determined by the values of R, A, and C. Now, um, typically, uh, if we just design the circuit with a gain equal to three, we will see that uh, the oscillations will eventually die. And so, in order to kickstart the circuit, notice that there is no input signal, by the way. I mean, the only input signal to the circuit is uh, what's being fed back from the output. Uh, but there is no external input signal applied to the circuit. Uh, typically, the input signal is going to be uh, some source of noise that is going to start creating an oscillation. Uh, or sometimes we can, you know, jumpstart the circuit by applying an input signal for a brief period of time. In the ideal case, we shouldn't have to do this. Uh, but the idea is if your gain were exactly equal to 3, uh, the oscillations will eventually die because of uh, internal losses and whatnot. And so typically what is done is we design the circuit to have a gain that is slightly greater than 3, but the problem comes. If we have a gain that is larger than 3, then what we're going to see is an oscillation that keeps growing and growing. And so what is typically used is a circuit with a gain slightly larger than 3 and then some means of gain stabilization is um, added to the circuit so that once the circuit, once the output signal reaches its final amplitude, um, that oscillation signal, then the gain gets stabilized. There's some sort of feedback path um, that is going to, to trim the gain, not allow the oscillation to keep growing. And that's what we're going to see in the next video.